Justice Minister, so Minister of the Department of what? I won't Just mention give me the department. <laughs> you, you are the good uh, uh, journalist that I've always known you to be. But, but it's so important to say that because yeah. had that minister kept quiet yeah. and no other minister asked the question, yeah. the decision would have been taken on that yeah. day. That brought the process back to us. And of course, we did what we had been taught very well by Trevor Manuel, which is yeah. do a rigorous job technical analysis yeah. that cannot be faulted in any way. Mm. Uh, and that's what we did. And then Pravin Godan and KBC Jonas get fired. Mm. I mean, that raises the bar. And then they, they give you Malisi Kikaba to mm. work with. Mm. How was that? I would be lying if I were to tell long stories about Mr. Kikaba uh, era. It was six weeks for me. Mm. That's when I made up my mind because I, I knew the risk that it would uh, that staying would entail. Hanging out with Clement on 702. Let's walk the talk. And on our hanging out feature this morning, we've got Standard Bank South Africa CEO Lungisa Fuzile. He is also the former Director General of the National Treasury. He spent 19 years there. And I said to the listeners earlier, Mr. Fuzile, that we you are one of the people that we owe so much to for having been resistors mm. of the state capture project. Um, and we'll get to that later on. Thank you for coming into studio. Good morning. A very good morning to you and uh, happy birthday. Uh, Thank you. Third anniversary. Is it? Third anniversary. Well done. Thank you. Is that, yes, you? that is in it. In Klasa, right? Yes. And I've got an interesting uh, joke about that because, uh, but you know, when eh? you have time to now, <laughs> yes. you know, there's a story that one old man told where he met uh, some English speakers uh, yeah. in the former Transkai and uh, they were confusing Siabulela with yeah. Siabulisa. Siabulisa. So when okay. they were saying thank you, they say what? Siabulisa manyate. Oh, they meant, they they thought they're saying thank you. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it's uh, Siabulela. Uh, okay, so you walked into the studio and you found these many cameras here and you said, this is an overkill. What's going on? And I said, well, you are a very important person. We, we always have these cameras ready for these important people we bring on on the on, on our hanging out feature uh, at ten o'clock. But you are an important person. You've played a critical role at National Treasury. You work for, and I said to Bongani earlier because I'm biased to the bank, the most amazing bank. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with Bongani because <laughs> I'm biased. You know, I, I bank with Standard Bank. How has it been so far since you left government and and you joined the private sector? It's been great, huh? I, I had um, an eight months break in between. Were you farming during that time? I, exactly. I, I, you know me all too well. <laughs> uh, I, I left Treasury um, mid-May mm. in 2017 and started at Standard Bank mid-January mm -hmm. 2018. Mm. And in that time, I had a moment uh, to, to reflect on, on the career that had been, uh, you know, two decades in the civil service. And, of course, to think about what I was going to do when I joined uh, Sim and, and uh, Ben mm -hmm. uh, at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, who were co-CEOs at Standard Bank. I've had a great time. Mm -hmm. I've had an absolutely fantastic time at, uh, at Standard Bank. I couldn't have made a better choice. Yeah. Were you <laughs> always someone who wanted to be where you are now? I mean, you've been a teacher before. Yes. What did you want to be growing up? You know, it's uh, life has got its own uh, ways to get one to one's destiny. Mm -hmm. Born of parents who were both teachers, they believed, especially my father, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, there could be no better profession <laughs> than <course>. teaching. <laughs> uh, so all five of us siblings, yeah. believe it or not, are teachers by profession. We carry five. certificates uh, as teachers. Even those of us who went to varsity, uh, thinking we were trying to uh, duck out of teaching. Did you not say, <clears> okay, <throat> at least the first three are teachers, you two do no. something different? No. Yesinyana. No, no compromise, uh, Clement. Ah. You, you ah. had to be a teacher. There was logic in it. Ah. Uh, the first one was that as a teacher, my, my, my parents, my father especially, but mm. both parents believed that 
teaching is a noble profession. It's actually yeah. really a good profession. If you yeah. think about it, every other profession is born out of teaching. Mm. You know, if, if you give a child, if you give a learner mm. a good foundation, mm. regardless of what phase or grade they are going through, you have in a way enabled them later on in life to become anything they choose to be. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so there was that, uh, that, that, that's the first part. But secondly, which I think was to become very important for me personally later on in life, is that teaching gives you the confidence to stand in front of people and express yourself. Mm. Uh, now, you don't have to be a teacher to get that. But you can't be a teacher without that. Mm. It also sort of enables you to understand that mastering a subject or content is not enough when you're going to stand in front of people and speak. Yeah. Preparing is everything. Uh, you, you've got to stand even in front of a mirror and imagine your class. Mm. Uh, think about the concepts that you want to convey or you want the learners to uh, acquire. Was that your process of preparation? Process. Yes. Wow. That was my process of preparation, Clement. So, so in a way, that's how I sort of started life, thinking that I would be a teacher. Uh, the, the ending up at the University of Natal as a lecturer yeah. was really an accident. Uh, but but a good one because uh, it allowed me then to further my studies for free. Yeah. Because when you worked at the university, you could study for free. Do I think, or did I think then, I could end up being a director general of the treasury? No. Did I even think when I was the director general of the treasury, I could become the CEO of the biggest bank by assets? On no. the continent. No, no. Uh, yeah, exactly on the continent. Mm. So some of those things uh, just happened uh, and you get people to notice you mm. when you play a particular role. Uh, they they acknowledge you, they affirm you, they sponsor you. And of course, you then, you know, accept that with yeah. alacrity, with both hands. And, and the rest is history. What value did you derive from teaching? You know, I often talk to the listeners about, I don't think we appreciate teachers enough. And I don't mm. think teachers sometimes themselves know the kind of role they play in just shaping our imagination about what's possible. Um, I mean, many of the greatest of stars will tell you that I got support from my teacher. My teacher noticed this talent even before their yeah, yeah. parents could. What was that value for you in when you were a teacher that you derived from just in that profession? So far apart from you at helping these kids understand these complicated concepts, whatever subjects you teach them. Uh, but there's a greater value than that. One of the, the values is, you know, applying your mind to understanding stuff deeply. You can't teach, you can't lecture effectively. You... you on a subject whose content yourself you have not mastered. Mm. And the greatest value of education, as educational philosophers have written extensively on, is in the ability to learn, mm. in the ability to search for information, and in the ability to understand how to acquire knowledge. Because that's a lifelong skill that you apply until you go to your grave. Mm. The, the, the notion that when there is something new, you know that I don't know it today, but I've got the ability to wrap my mind around it and understand it. Mm. it it's the most powerful thing about education, which is <clears throat> the difference between an educated person and a knowledgeable person. As a philosopher, R.S. Peters, uh, would have said. Mm. If you don't mind, let me take a minute to explain myself with this. They say, what R.S. Peter says is, a knowledgeable person is someone who may have read lots of books, may even actually have grappled with and understood mathematical concepts mm. such that they can solve mathematical problems. 
simultaneous equations, dynamic optimization uh, uh, problems in economics, mm. you name all, all of them. So the person can get distinctions in class, but you get them out of class and demand or ask of them that they apply that knowledge. Mm. They don't have that ability. And that person is not educated. Mm. They know a lot. But an educated person is the one who has acquired concepts and has the ability to apply them outside of the classroom. Mm. So when they look at the world around them, they interpret it in ways that someone who hasn't had the opportunity they have yeah. can't. Yeah. Except, you know, for a few exceptional individuals who teach themselves stuff and have that ability. Yeah. So from teaching to lecturer, <coughs> then joining government, you're with... I mean, you wait Statistics South Africa at some yes, point, Yes, for right? just one year. For just, <laughs> what did they do Stayed to you? a bit. To just leave, to just stay for a year? <laughs> no, it, it's interesting. You know, Clement, it was a beautiful story. My boss yeah. at Statistics South Africa, I hope she wouldn't mind me mentioning her name, uh -huh. was a certain Mrs. Nile, uh -huh. an Africana woman married to an Africana, but progressive. Mm. And I say this unashamedly. She wasn't even part of interviewing me to join uh, Stats Essay, mm -hmm. uh, but inherited me as part of her team. And in no time, she said, you, it was very direct. I'm not saying that I am what she described, but she said, you, you're clever. You, you write so well. I suspect that you will take over from me. Now, that's kind of, this is like within maybe two months of working under her. And that, how far apart were your positions? No, I was reporting directly, directly to her. Directly to her. I okay. was reporting directly to her. So she would come to my office uh, during lunch, sit with me, say, can, can we have lunch? So she would ask me about my background. Uh -huh. She took such a keen interest in me. When there were opportunities uh, to uh, travel to Australia to learn about uh, you know, uh, economic statistics, mm -hmm. She said, you are the one I would go uh, to Australia with. She literally wept when I, I left, left uh, uh, Statistics SA because mm -hmm. she felt that her succession plan was falling apart. But I told her, so I said, look, as much as I've done statistics and I enjoy it, but my passion is economics. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that the Department of Finance then, uh, which uh, um, was headed by Maria Ramos as the Director General, uh, Trevor Manuel as the Minister, mm -hmm. Well, would be my better home. Mm. So I, I transitioned there uh, after a year, and yeah. the rest is history. As wow. I say. We, and we'll talk about that transition and when you joined government to up to now, when you are now Standard Bank South Africa CEO. What kind of music do you listen to, though? I listen to jazz, um, and it's uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, and it's got a lot to do also with the fact that I've got those moments where I just want to be alone and I, I, I enjoy just listening and thinking. Yeah. But also, I enjoy driving long distances and I find just to be quite calming when, uh, when in those situations. And, and when you're driving long distances, do you enjoy with, with a companion, having a conversation, or you don't mind just being with the music? Interestingly, when there's someone around, I can do without the music at all. Okay. Uh, but when I'm alone, it, 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 it works better. When I'm traveling with my wife, daughter, yeah. uh, relatives, I'm fine to have a conversation. And, and I can be a very funny guy. Uh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, there's, <laughs> I don't take myself seriously at all. Is it? At all. Ah, okay, uh, interesting. <laughs> um, here's one of the songs uh, that Mr. Lungisa Fuzili listens to that he truly enjoys. It's 25 minutes before 11 o'clock. Lungisa Fuzile is hanging out with us on uh, the Clement Manyatella show this morning. I want to talk about your time now. Or oh, before I do, let me just go to some calls and WhatsApps before the listeners get angry with me. Uh, I'm going to ask you to put on the headphones, please, Mr. Fuzile. Lungisi, you're calling us from Midrand. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Clement. Sure, sure. Go ahead. I wanted to, to tell a story about the weekend after the weekend special. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what happened? Were you working but at because, Treasury? I was working at Treasury, and I'm still at Treasury right now. Uh -huh. But when I first uh, met him, Mr. Fuzzi, I was still an intern. Mm -hmm. So I bumped into him uh, outside the Treasury buildings. Mm -hmm. So as I, was, as I was still trying to gather myself, he looked at me and he greeted me like we were old friends. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I never actually forgot that. Wow. After the 
the, the state capture saga of the weekend special, I think Mr. Fuzzy, that, that Monday called a, a meeting of his entire staff at Treasury. Mm. Right? And then he told us exactly what had transpired. And he spoke confidently and gave people hope that Treasury, because the mood was was very somber at the time and people were concerned. Mm. But I have to say that um, even maybe to this day, uh, even the current DGs may admit that they have not yet of the big boot that Mr. Fuzzy left the treasury. Mm. Oh, yes. Mlingisi, that, that's such a great message. Thank you for uh, for calling me. Mlingisi is, is calling there from Midrand. Used to be a member of your staff. Yeah. Yeah, and apparently you're not a bad boss. <laughs> <laughs> At least in so far as Mlungis is concerned. It's concerned. <laughs> Others still, may have other experiences. Still early in the show. Uh, uh, How was it, though, during that time, uh, Mr. You know, I, I said, and I know you're such a modest person because you don't, uh, you don't <laughs> like it when people talk about you in this manner. But I was telling the listeners earlier that what state capture has shown us is that they are enablers of state capture. But what the state capture project has shown us is that they are also resistors of state capture. And I think you are one of the resistors at state, of, of state capture because you served as the DG at Treasury when there was every single attempt being made to capture that institution. And even in Lungisi, with the reference he makes to when Des Van Royen arrived at Treasury, you were the when Jacob Zuma tried to move Treasury to the presidency, you were there. When the nuclear deal, which was going to be the biggest ever financial commitment that South Af- the South African government was going to make, was being rushed through without following the right processes, and we didn't even know how it would be financed, uh, you were there. So National Treasury could have fallen onto the wrong hands had it not been for people like you and your colleagues at the time, when did you start noticing things change at Treasury where you thought, hey man, something is weird here. Some people are trying to get their hands on this critical institution. Pardon me for doing this, and I will be brief with it so that it doesn't get lost at all. Um, there were many people who made it their business to preserve the institutions of our democracy first. Second, who sought to make sure that neither cabinet nor, say, parliament strayed uh, during that era. There are many of them. It's important to land that point, and I can give examples later on uh, of of those instances without perhaps mentioning the names of people. Mm Democracy only works and can only be saved from those who want to undermine it if every part of the system plays its role, has people who understand quite deeply and profoundly the significance of why each institution exists and why they occupy the roles that they occupy. It's important to learn that point. But let me then respond on the parts that uh, talk about me as having laid that context. It was towards the end of Mr. Zuma's first term, Mm -hmm. which was at the Treasury, the end of Mr. Praveen Gordon's first tenure, Mm. Mm. that it became obvious to me that uh, no, no, no. Uh, things have gone very, very bad here. It's public knowledge. I'm not divulging stuff that's uh, classified now because of the Zondo Commission. You know that uh, Minister Gordon went to, and I, and and Clubis went to uh, the Zondo Commission and testified that, for an example, uh, there was pressure at one point to have Petro SA by uh, engine, mm. uh, mentioning companies by name, but it's there, it's in the public mm. domain. Now, there was no logic to it. The process was so flawed, so it defied logic. It was, it was so clear that uh, this, this is not in the interest of South mm. Africa and South Africans. Mm. Uh, certain people somewhere 
have agreed that if we do this this way, then we will meet each other somewhere and share the spoils. Yeah. Um, and chapter and verse is set out in those submissions that we made to the Zondo Commission. For an example, it's basic stuff. You know that if you are going to buy a company, you do what is called due diligence, DD. You would have heard mm. people say that mm. because you want to know, you know, are you buying a company uh, that is um, a going concern, that doesn't have too much liabilities, that if you think about an engine or let's say a business in a refining, uh, uh, oil refining, uh, uh, you know, operation, uh, does it not require re-equipping or retooling mm. with massive investments required? And if, of course, it requires that, then you've got to value it accordingly. In other words, discount the price mm. so that it reflects that you will have to put in more money mm. to get it to, uh, you know, more modern uh, operations. So stuff like that hadn't been done. And people didn't want to hear about it. They just want you to sign off. You know, uh, and both ministers, mm. uh, Gordon and Nene, encountered this stuff. So it was clear to me that mm. that was the first example. The other example then is the nuclear one that you spoke about. Mm. There was a committee originally chaired child, by the deputy president uh, with ministers, and then its composition or constitution got changed uh, overnight, and, uh, and the president got to chair it himself uh, with uh, selected uh, ministers, ministers, most of them... Uh, 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 pliable, I won't mention their names here, but it's there, it's there in, it's there. in the public Teenager domain. Med Peterson, yeah. Museven, Zizwani, exactly, and then, exactly. Yeah. So, so the ministers were there. I mean, the late one may have sold rest in peace. So, the, the staff was there. So, then things sort of moved from bad to worse. Where, if you just cast your mind back, I mean, when the proposal went to cabinet first time before the day Mr. Nene got fired, which mm. was the second time it went. Mm. The normal way cabinet functions, there would be committees two weeks before the week that cabinet sits. Mm. And most stuff gets processed in the committees, considered thoroughly, including its financial implications. Mm. So I had gone to cabinet for a different reason, and I saw my colleagues from energy with massive files, mm -hmm. reams of paper. And I knew, at first I suspected, later I knew because I asked someone who was in cabinet, I said, mm. does nuclear feature on the program? And the answer was yes. Now, I was DG of Treasury, and I hadn't seen a cabinet memorandum on nuclear. And here it is, about here to be presented it is. at cabinet. Naturally, it has financial implications. Uh -huh. Now, here is then the data point to confirm the point I was making to you, that it was not just Treasury. A minister, not the Minister of Finance, a minister in cabinet, raised her hand, note her hand, mm. female minister, and said, oh, yeah, I see this. I don't know a lot about nuclear, but very basic that I know is that it can be very expensive, especially... Mm at the implementation phase mm. before you switch it on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm surprised that on financial implications, there isn't a single number here. Surely we have a treasury that is supposed to tell us, can we afford it and how will we finance it? Yeah. And that set a process that defined a new path for the nuclear procurement process. This minister is the minister of the department of what? I won't Just mention give me the department. <laughs> you, you are the good uh, uh, journalist that I've always known you to be. But, but it's so important to say that because yeah. had that minister kept quiet yeah. and no other minister asked the question, yeah. the decision would have been taken on that yeah. day. That brought the process back to us. And of course, we did what we had been taught very well by Trevor Manuel, which is yeah. do a rigorous job, technical analysis yeah. that cannot be faulted in any way. Mm. Uh, and that's what we did. But what was the morale at the time? Because the, the, the problem about the public sector is we are losing critical skills. Mm -hmm. Not because always it's greener pastures, but because people don't want to work in these 
political environments where they have to be put under unnecessary pressure to sign off on deals that just don't make practical sense mm. and they are not of the benefit of this country. Did you consider resigning at the time? Uh, because, w yes, I'm a DG of Treasury. I understand my responsibility to the Republic. But do I want to be part of this environment that doesn't let me do my job? Where things fly over my head that I'm supposed to approve? Essentially, Clement. No, uh, let me answer your question quite directly. No, I didn't. I always had the option in my back pocket, by the mm. way, that if a point had come, where someone with a, a loaded gun pointed to my head said, sign this. Mm. I wouldn't sign it. Mm. Uh, I would walk. I always really had that 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 provision. But I'm not a faint-hearted guy. I mean, I, I got into the role. I mean, think about it. I, I had grown in the Treasury. Mm. I've worked with tough people, really tough people. You know many of them. Trevor, Maria, Lesicha, Ishmael Momoniat was still there, mm. by the way. I mean, mm. like tough guys, you know. So I never had illusion that it's going to be easy. I understood the political pressure that went with the job. Yeah. And I also knew that not everyone had all these noble goals of a better life for all and stuff. They would say it, but they didn't mean it genuinely. Mm. So, so I knew that. And I understood, uh, as it happened when people were persuading me to raise my hand to take the role, that it was going to be a tough role. When I decided I was going to do it, I was reluctant, by the way. But when I decided I was going to take it, I didn't get into it with the idea that if it gets tough, I mm. will walk. No, no, no. So, so mm. I was there. But, and interestingly, you asked the question about the mood. The, the team felt the knocks, but it was, it was committed people. Mm -hmm. Very resilient people, you know, activists who had done time uh, in in jail during um, the apartheid years, yeah. and, and who wanted to make sure that democracy was preserved mm -hmm. and the institutions of democracy, including the treasury, continued to be strong. And then Pravin Godan and KBC Jonas get fired. Mm -hmm. I mean, that raises the bar. And then they they give you Malisi Kikaba mm -hmm. to work with. Mm -hmm. How was that? I would be lying if I were to tell long stories about Mr. Kikaba uh, era. It was six weeks for me. Mm. That's when I made up my mind because I, I knew the risk that it would uh, that staying would entail. I could just imagine, you know, if I had stayed longer, what you would have seen now is. If you do an internet search of my name, mm. uh, Lugis Afuzle, oh, got suspended as DG. Mm. You know, and I didn't want that blemish mm. next to my name. Mm. Uh, Standard Bank wouldn't have touched me. Others who wanted to, uh, uh, you know, who offered me uh, jobs after I left the treasury wouldn't have wanted to be associated with someone with such a blemish next to their name. Mm. So I had to preserve my name and at the same time hope that my departure makes the point mm. to those who care to say, hang on, you mustn't tolerate this situation where. Mm one of the critical pillars of our democracy is you know put under immense pressure by those with ill intentions and you stand and watch yeah you know do something about it mm. do you regret having worked for a government and invested so much t so much of your time um only to live under those circumstances <laughs> i normally tell my current boss that uh, if I hadn't had the opportunity to work for a decent institution mm. and do things that impact people's lives positively, mm. enable people to acquire their first home, their first car, pay for their weddings, you, you know, all the things that banks enables people, uh, enable people to do. Mm. If I hadn't had that opportunity, perhaps I would have died a very bitter man. <laughs> if you ask me, I mean, do I regret the fact that I ever took the job at the Treasury and went through what I went through? Not a moment of it, because mm. it's a phase that the country had to go through, mm. and I was not alone in it. I, I had exceptional bosses. All the ministers I served under, I mean the credible ones, Yeah, you know them. I want to. Except Malusi. Except all the ministers that I served <laughs> under, the credible ones, yeah. they were honorable men. Yeah. If on any day they were to lead any organization anywhere, and uh, I, I, you know, I would 
exit Standard Bank and they say, can you partner with this? I would go run. Definitely. So that, for me, mm. the, the difficult times enable you to see mm. who is truly good yeah. versus the others. Yeah, it's eight minutes uh, before 11 o'clock. Let me go to some of the WhatsApp messages that are coming through. Hi, Clement. Oh, your guest, man, par excellence, a man of integrity and principle, a man who stands for the truth, even though the heavens fall. May God bless him abundantly. That's a message from TJ um, in Sosha. Another person says, Hi, Clement. I worked under Lungisa and Mrs. Nell at Stets SA, and he's an amazing individual. That's Eric Diale. Ah, do you remember Eric? I do. <laughs> I do. He was a clever guy. Yeah. Yeah. He was a programmer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Another one says, hi, Clement. Ah, that's my CEO right there, Mr. Lungisa Fuzile. Very proud of him. I'm listening while working from home. Regards, Mweke Etsi. Hi, Clement. Uh, you have an excellent leadership in your studios. Thank you, Lungisa, for leading us. That is Sanil in the Johannesburg CVD. And another message says, Clement, tell Umkaya, uh, Uba Siam Kumbula E Mkaduli. Mkanduli. Mkanduli. Oh, Mkanduli. <laughs> <laughs> Got you there. I tried. <laughs> Sorry. Is that an area? That's an area. I I I I, I thought if you went into this <laughs> one, I would tease you. Uh, you don't know it, but let me ask you: Do you know Hole in the Wall? Yes. Coffee Bay. I know Coffee Bay. Yeah. They Head are of in, it. Though. They are in Mkandul. Oh. So Mkanduli then is what? It's, it's is a, it a district. A district. Yes. Oh, okay. And is within that, the district that you would have. Is that where you come from? Yes. Mkanduli. That's the district from which I come yeah. from. And this person says, yes, I'm Kumbula Mkanduli. The guy is likes farming and umziwake. Kukwa long life because it resembles long life uh, box picture. What does that mean? Gupopolo. Uh, Inu <laughs> popo. <laughs> no, it's a, no, it's just a, a cause of phrase that means it's a big fellow. Oh. But the, the Mkanduli thing refers to the fact that uh, yeah. our house in the village is kind of modeled on Cape Dutch uh, plan. Oh. Yes, if you look at the long life milk, yeah. it looks like uh, Cape Dutch. Okay, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, Mkanduli. Style. Okay, what do you think of, of, of our state of the economy? You know, I, I had your, your boss on the show about... Was it last year, Abel, when we had... Yeah, about a year now, About I a think, year you know. ago, yeah. Uh, Mr. Sim Chabalala. And then I asked him about, you know, the state of our economy. And, and I realized that he's such an optimistic man, more optimistic mm. than I am. When you look at the economy today, I had the Reserve Bank governor yesterday. Mm. And we were talking about what he says are self-inflicted wounds that have led us to some of the challenges this economy has faced and the kind of inflation we've seen. Yes, there are global factors, but there are also domestic factors that we could have avoided. I had Sipong Kosi just two days ago, uh, who is the former CEO of mining giant, mm -hmm. Exaro, whose responsibility is to cut the red tape and make it easy to do business in South Africa. And he himself is frustrated by the very same system he's trying to fix. When you look at the state of this economy, is there hope? What's your assessment? No, there is some hope, uh, Clement. And it's not... Uh, I, I am quite aligned to Sim. I mean, we may define degrees, the words we choose uh, to characterize the situation. If you just think about the energy situation, in the challenge lies immense opportunities. What are the opportunities that are in that space? And we're harvesting them already, but we took too long to get where we are. The moment government reset the policy framework, signed <clears throat> successive bid windows to allow renewable uh, energy projects to take off the ground, mm -hmm. they took off like wildfire on a windy day mm -hmm. in winter. The investments that have been made, in other words, what you are having there is a, an across the board positive response Firms are investing in alternative, alternative energy sources. Businesses, big and small, mm. are doing the same. Households are doing the same. We bank them and we welcome them with open arms. Yeah. We have set up digital platforms mm. that enable people to access these in the convenience of their homes, match suppliers and those who want to buy. Yeah. And in the process, we insert ourselves and fund them 
and we say to people, for instance, who have got home loans, you, if you have your access bond with us, as I suspect you do, I do. If you have, uh, you know, am I going to get a discount? If you have equity, <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. you if you have, we can negotiate it, Declan, <laughs> but not over radio. <laughs> Uh, but I can assure you, if, if you've yeah. got equity in your bond, you, you know, accessing it very easily to finance uh, an alternative solution. So yeah. the response is overwhelming. The banks, not only our own, mm. but ours has committed that between 250 and 300 billion rand between now and 2026, we have earmarked it for renewable energy projects. If that were to be exhausted, by mm. the way, it's not, it's just a limit we have set ourselves for purposes of planning. We would increase it because we want to be part of solving that problem. Now, why do I use this example? And I've taken some time to explain it. It's to indicate to you that our solutions are here amongst us. Mm. All you need are very open minds to the fact that our economy is so modern, so complex, cannot be driven by either the private sector only or government only. It requires a partnership. And you must harness it by setting and resetting regulations such that they enable that. Yeah, We have the solutions amongst ourselves. Of course, you need decisive leadership. You need people who will take tough decisions, not the easy ones, the convenient ones that get people to clap for you, even if mm. they're bad. You, know? you need decisions that set a country on a course that doesn't work today and tomorrow only, mm, mm. but works five years, ten years. And, and that's how we were socialized getting into government, Mr. Mandela, Mr. Mbeki. And you saw that approach to policymaking, to governing, works. I don't know if you remember yeah. this. By the time Mr. Mbeki left, the economy was growing at 5.6%. 5.6%. It's now forecast at just point Fraction of a percent. Fraction, fraction of a percent. Yeah. It's the same country. Yeah. Mr. Lungisa Fuzile, thank you so much for coming through and making time for us. What a pleasure it has been to it's be It's been with you. such a pleasure to have you. Hanging out with Clement on 702. Let's walk the talk.